Hello and welcome to today's Q&A about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis webinar. My name is Bev Bromfield and I'll be your moderator for today's presentations. Before we start, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. We've taken a screenshot of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer desktop in the upper right corner. You've joined this presentation using your computer speaker system by default. This means if you hear music throughout, oops, excuse me, if you hear music through your computer, you should be able to hear the presentation. If you prefer to join over the telephone, select use telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. Although we are highlighting questions received in advance of today's webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit questions to today's presentation by typing into the questions pane on the control panel. We'll collect these and address as many as possible during our Q&A today with Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Husney. Before I provide information about the foundation, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our sponsors, AbbVie, Amgen, Bristol-Myers-Squibb, Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, and Novartis for their support of today's webinar. Since some of you may be new to the foundation, here's a little background about who we are, our mission, and what we do. For over 50 years, the National Psoriasis Foundation has served more than 8 million individuals in the U.S. living with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Founded from a tiny classified ad in Portland, Oregon, the NPF mission is to drive efforts to cure psoriatic disease and improve the lives of those affected. After completing one of the most ambitious strategic plans in its history, the National Psoriasis Foundation launched a strategic plan on July 1, 2019. With a continued focus on a life free of psoriatic disease and its burdens, NPF remains committed to finding a cure for psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis while supporting individuals to live longer and healthier lives. Over the next five years, MPF will focus on achieving three goals to lead collaborative, transformational research in psoriatic disease, increase the lifespan and health of individuals living with psoriatic disease, secure the human, technological, and financial resources necessary to achieve NPF's mission-related goals. By attending to these program, you've already taken a step towards expanding your knowledge about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, moving towards a better understanding of what it means to live with psoriatic disease. A few of the many ways that MPF supports the goal of leading collaborative transformational research includes, to date, NPF has funded over 24 million in grants and fellowships. That includes over 3 million in grant and fellowship funding announced uh, this last summer. NPF grant mechanisms support all stages of research and careers. Our efforts focus on areas of unmet need and are often conducted in partnership with research stakeholders with whom we collaborate. In addition to funding outside grants and fellowships, the NPF also leads research initiatives such as the Research Prevention Initiative and the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which are new to the foundation. The Psoriasis Prevention Initiative was developed at the recommendation of the Psoriasis Prevention Initiative Steering Committee, who urged the definition of prevention to better guide the proposal development. And that's how it expanded to disease relapse and comorbidities. NPF plans to invest $6.5 million over five years in this effort. The second initiative is the Psoriatic Arthritis Diagnostic Test Grant, which aims to develop a diagnostic test for psoriatic arthritis. This could significantly reduce the time between onset of symptoms and a diagnosis. This is important because we know as little as six months of delay between onset of symptoms of psoriatic arthritis and start of treatment can lead to permanent joint damage. This slide highlights four NPF research efforts that you can be part of. The NPF Corona National Psoriasis Patient Registry is the largest independent observational registry of psoriasis patients in the United States. This registry collects and studies patient health information, allowing researchers to compare the safety and effectiveness of psoriasis treatment, better understand conditions that are related to psoriasis, and explore the history of the disease. There are currently more than over 11,000 patients enrolled at more than 270 sites across the country. Your dermatologist may be enrolled as an NPF Corona National Psoriasis Patient Registry site. 
Not sure if they are? Ask. If they are not, encourage them to join. The LIGHT study is a real-world research study that compares the effectiveness of home versus office-based UVB phototherapy treatment of psoriasis. Entry criteria for the study are simple. You must be age 12 or older, have plaque or good teeth psoriasis, and be a candidate for office or home phototherapy. There's no washout of topical, oral, or biologic medications, and the study is designed to be easily incorporated into routine patient care. It is also unique because it includes equal representation of all skin phototypes. Citizen Scientist is a platform where you as a patient answer survey questions, which you and your researchers can analyze for trends and new insights. Citizen Scientist is currently being revitalized for greater community benefit. The NPF Annual Survey is a data collection effort the Foundation has conducted for two decades. This important research conducted each fall provides insight into the lived experience of individuals with psoriasis, including quality of life and the unmet needs. If you're contacted about this annual survey, we would appreciate you sharing your experiences with us. To achieve the Foundation's goals as mentioned, please support our mission through donations or by participating in virtual Team NPF events such as Stamp Out Psoriasis Walker Cycle events. You can learn more at psoriasis.org slash donate or at teamnpf.org. And on behalf of the National Psoriasis Foundation, thank you for attending today's webinar. Well, you'll learn more on about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. This webinar is truly for you since your questions form the basis of what Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Husney will discuss today. Today's questions will be broken out by categories, which will be mentioned shortly. If submitted questions today, if you're submitting questions today, please type in your questions based on the announced topic. We'll try to address as many as questions as possible in the time allowed. And now I'd like to introduce you to our speakers, dermatologist Dr. Anthony Fernandez and rheumatologist Dr. Elaine Husney. Dr. Fernandez is the Director of Medical Dermatology and the WD Steck Chair of Clinical Dermatology in the Departments of Dermatology and Pathology at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Dr. Fernandez specializes in the treatment of inflammatory diseases that includes psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, dermatomyositis, uh, and lupus. He is board certified in dermatology and dermapathology and is a member of the Rheumatologic Dermatology Society, the National Psoriasis Foundation, American Academy of Dermatology, and other professional organizations. Dr. Husney is the Vice Chair of Rheumatology and Director of the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Treatment Center, also at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, where she is also the Director of the Musculoskeletal Outcomes Research and the Fellows Research Committee for the Rheumatology Department. Dr. Husney is involved in a number of rheumatology clinical trials at the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Husney is also an assistant professor at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine of Case Western Reserve University. She is a member of the National Psoriasis Foundation's Board of Directors, a past member of the Medical Board, and a professional member of the National Psoriasis Foundation. Please welcome Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Husney. Welcome everyone. So uh, thank you, Beth, for what a wonderful introduction and uh, what a wonderful way to hear about all the great things that the National Psoriasis Foundation um, has done. It's always great to hear it all in the same sort of five minutes of their research, patient advocacy um, efforts. It's um, very, um, very impressive. Um, so today we're going to talk, uh, Dr. Fernandez and I are going to talk about uh, Q and A um, questions and answers that were um, addressed by you, by the audience, who have given us some great questions. Uh, we have decided to have them broken down into symptoms, treatments, related conditions, and research. Um, so we're going to start um, with symptoms um, as our first category. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I'd also like to thank Bev for the invitation. And so uh, let's get started with these questions. The first question is, how do you know if it's psoriasis or eczema? That is an excellent question. 
And believe it or not, most of the time we can tell the difference just visually by looking at the rash when a patient comes into our clinic. Psoriasis tends to present with very well demarcated areas of rash, meaning that there's a sharp demarcation between the rash and then normal skin. Also, psoriasis tends to occur in several different anatomic locations, such as the elbows, the knees, the scalp is a common location. So when those well demarcated plaques present in those areas, it also makes it easy for us to distinguish. Psoriasis additionally tends to have a much thicker scale than eczema has. And when patients pick off the scale, they tend to bleed in those areas quite easily. So all of those things can help us distinguish psoriasis from eczema, which tends to be less demarcated, thinner and more pink uh, type of rash. But there are times where it can be challenging to distinguish. And in those cases, we will perform a biopsy of the skin. And under the microscope, there are distinct histologic features that we can look for to distinguish in those hard cases between psoriasis and eczema. So I would say the vast, vast majority of time, we can either just visually or by using a skin biopsy distinguish between those two types of rashes. Great, that's really helpful. I was just wondering, um, do uh, the differences um, ever, you know, I was thinking about itching and pain, is it similar between psoriasis and eczema or different? The, I would say in general, eczema tends to be itchier than psoriasis, but many patients with psoriasis have itching. So that, I think from a symptomatic standpoint, it gets more challenging. Um, if, if we, you know, if, if visually looking and doing an examination, if we have a difficult time telling the difference, we do not rely on symptoms that the patient has. We will get a biopsy and try to look at, you know, the details under the microscope to help us distinguish between psoriasis and eczema. Thank you. So second question, can psoriatic arthritis cause chronic pitting and edema of the lower extremities? So I would say that in itself, we do not consider, you know, chronic pitting and edema a, you know, classic uh, symptom of psoriatic arthritis. However, many patients um, do present um, with lower extremity swelling, and that can be from associated conditions with psoriatic arthritis. So many of our patients um, that suffer from psoriatic arthritis may have hypertension, may have associated, um, you know, elevated BMI or um, being, um, you know, overweight, uh, metabolic syndrome. So many of these things can then, in a related condition, um, cause some problems with um, getting our fluid levels, um, you know, in check. So meaning that, you know, if you don't have problems with um, high blood pressure or heart disease, you tend to be able to mobilize your fluids better. Um, unfortunately, when you do have some of these, sometimes you can lead to um, having swelling of the extremities, especially the lower extremities. Um, but I would not think of that as a uh, classic symptom, I should say, of psoriatic arthritis. Great. For psoriatic arthritis, what symptoms are important for a provider to know if not specifically asked? And what should I, as a patient, look for as the disease progresses? Right, so this is a great question about um, important symptoms that you might want to prepare for, um, you know, before your rheumatology visit or think about, you know, sometimes it gets really difficult when you are sort of looking on the internet and looking at all these symptoms. It's almost like, oh, I could have that, I could have that, you know. But what are, what are some of the symptoms that may be more specific to psoriatic arthritis? So what we look for, um, in addition to the skin psoriasis, is what kind of joint pain are you having? Is it joint pain that's both in the joints and in the muscles and in the extremities? So all up and down your arm versus just the joints. So I think that becomes really important for us to know. We also wanna know, um, is, the, is there joint swelling or is there just joint pain? Is there joint stiffness or just joint pain? 
So with psoriatic arthritis, we definitely get more of the joint swelling um, as well as the stiffness. So when I mean stiffness, it's not just stiffness for a couple minutes, like after I get out of a car from a long car ride, but it's really um, what we see almost an hour of morning stiffness. So when the alarm goes off, you don't even want to pull off your covers because you're so stiff. You're almost taking, you know, a, you know, you know, many minutes to just kind of relax and just kind of get out and you don't even feel loose by the time you go to the bathroom, for instance, first thing in the morning. So we look for joint stiffness, joint swelling. So you want to kind of um, be prepared to answer those questions. Um, you also want to, to know if you have, um, you know, what's your pattern of joints that are affected? Is it, you know, the small joints just in your hands and your toes, or is it the large joints? Wow, it's really my knee, you know, and my hip or my shoulder. Um, so those are things that I think are important um, to think about. And what should a patient look for as the disease progresses? So this is really um, interesting question because doctors um, are also looking for that. You know, we wish there was, um, you know, a blood test or, or, or something that a patient has on exam that we could say, hey, you are going to be somebody that's going to progress. And so unfortunately, we don't have it that easy. You really do have to develop a relationship with your physician where they can monitor, um, you know, many of your signs and symptoms. So that includes um, the history, like what things are going on, uh, look at uh, your exam as well, as well as look at labs and imaging. So we actually take all of those things together and we try to um, you know, help a patient see if they are at risk um, for progression. So it's not really any one thing that we see that say, oh, you're definitely gonna progress, but rather it's really the clinical picture that we see over time um, that we try to um, look for um, disease progression. So next category, we're gonna talk about um, psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis treatments. So the first question is, what is the best option for biologics um, that one may um, uh, go on if they're on a Medicare? And do you um, necessarily have to switch um, to an infusion medication? So I think both of us can answer that. I'll probably take a first stab and then I'll, I'll hand it over to Dr. Fernandez. Um, but I would say that, you know, uh, this has really been interesting because I think each sort of different Medicare carrier and, and different insurances, I should say, may prioritize, you know, one or two biologics and may not prioritize one or two other biologics. So, so therefore, uh, you know, sometimes we'll have to go through a prior off um, process, which we have to then send in paperwork um, about um, the patient's condition. And whether or not you need to switch to infusion, I think is an interesting question because sometimes uh, medicines that we bring home, so that's either a pill or injection, uh, may um, carry a certain um, copay. While if you are able to do an infusion medicine where, you know, Dr. Fernandez and I would actually see somebody in the infusion unit and get an infusion um, of one of the disease modifying agents, um, then there may be different payments um, in where um, those infusions are covered. So I think maybe that's where uh, that question may be going to. But I'd love to hear Dr. Fernandez's view as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, this is a this is an interesting question, and I think it in in many ways highlights how, despite our knowledge about psoriasis as physicians, we sometimes are forced to prescribe medicines that may not be what we when you know when we're talking to patients when we as a patient physician team agree is the treatment that we want um, so I, I think um, sometimes we just have to go with what the insurance will cover i will say that i do think we're lucky that we have a lot of options in psoriasis and most of the time we can tell within a relatively short period of time about three months whether or not that option is well tolerated um, and whether it works. And if they're not, I do think insurance companies, including Medicare, are reasonable and will eventually approve the medicines that we think are appropriate when we've demonstrated that we've tried what they prefer or what they will cover. And it has either not been tolerated because of side effects or doesn't work or both. 
So there seems to be, next question, is some conflicting information about methotrexate and whether it can reduce joint damage um, and like to get your advice on, on methotrexate. So methotrexate definitely is our tried and true. This has been around for over 20 years. Um, we know how to use it. We understand the side effects. Um, it does have um, a really nice flexible sort of um, dosage so we can start low and we can you know really ramp up the dosage as needed depending on how patients respond we can give it in a pill form we can give it um, you know in a subcutaneous form uh, but it is uh, what I would consider uh, more of the early first line um, treatment um, for psoriatic arthritis um, so obviously this is an oral medication once a week um, that's used with folic acid. Um, and we do classify it as a DMARD. So um, DMARD stands for disease modifying anti-rheumatic um, drug. And to get the labeling of a DMARD, it does have to change um, or reduce um, some joint inflammation in order to get that designation. So I would say overall, um, it should be pretty clear that methotrexate is considered a DMARD. Um, so unlike something like steroids, which you may use a lot. So steroids um, sometimes can also decrease inflammation, but it doesn't really change. Um, it's not um, designated as a disease modifying agent. It just takes care of the signs and symptoms, but doesn't over the long term um, actually reduce joint damage. So I would consider methotrexate a disease modifying agent. What are the treatments for scalp and face psoriasis? Another great question and um, really a challenging problem. Uh, because the scalp, one of the problems with the scalp is even if you only have it there, it's a challenge to get medicines to the skin of the scalp because hair gets in the way and the medicine tends to stick in the hair. And so, uh, and with the face, the challenge is it's a sensitive anatomic location. So we have to be very careful with the strength of medications that we use. So we do, you know, let's assume that, that a patient has psoriasis limited to the, scase, the face and or scalp. That's a relatively small body surface area. So we typically will try to start with very conservative medicines. We wanna control this with the safest medicine regimen that we can and we'll try topical medicines for the scalp we'll typically try solutions so medicines that are um, in an oil base or a pure liquid alcohol base that can get through the hair to the skin of the scalp uh, sometimes even shampoos and for the face we'll try topical medicines usually mild to moderate potency topical corticosteroids or calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus or pimecrolimus. But oftentimes those are not effective enough to make patients happy. And so because these are sensitive anatomic locations, you know, the face, the genital areas, those are anatomic locations that we really pay close attention to getting the skin to look the way that patients want because it doesn't affect them only just physically. There's a tremendous psychologic impact on patients when they have psoriasis in those areas. So even if patients have overall mild disease, one or two percent body surface area, if topical medicines aren't effective, we certainly will think about systemic options, whether those be traditional immunosuppressive medicines like methotrexate, or uh, newer oral medicines like a premolast or biologics. So what we do what we need to do to get patients to the point where they are comfortable and we're, we're treating the entire disease, not only just those physical areas of rash, but also the psychologic uh, components and um, other components as well. So next question, what is the best treatment when you have enthesitis as part of psoriatic arthritis? So we have really um, been able to understand enthesitis a lot better um, than we had been in the past. Um, enthesitis refers to where the tendon attaches to the bone, a um, very specific area that can get inflamed um, in patients with uh, psoriatic arthritis. 
And what we've seen um, is that the measurements for enthesitis is a lot better now in clinical trials than it has been in the past. So the newer drugs, the newer biologic um, medications um, now have really great clinical measures because enthesitis is, um, can be a little difficult on exam because it's not really um, in the joint itself, but it's usually a, a, what we call a periarticular um, structure. So it's sort of around the joint. So it's in the Achilles heel um, or in the patella tendon or in the epicondylitis in, uh, by your elbow. So sometimes these can take a little bit more skill to really palpate and to see if they're having trouble in the joint or trouble in the emphysitis. Um, when we, um, you know, just have maybe uh, early signs of emphysitis or maybe just one area, um, the, the treatment guidelines um, do recommend anti-inflammatories. Sometimes if it's a really, um, you know, one area, very recalcitrant, some people are, are comfortable to do a little bit of steroid injections in the tendons. Um, but sometimes people get emphysitis in many areas of their, um, of their body, not just the Achilles tendon, but on both elbows, on both knees. And so when it becomes a little bit more systemic, um, we then um, utilize biologic uh, medications have um, really good, so the anti-TNF class of therapy have um, good data as well as the IL-17, as well as the IL-1223. Um, there's also good data uh, with Aprimolast. So many of the treatments um, now, uh, the newer ones have data that can back up um, what we call emphysitis resolution. Um, some of the older um, medications that we use um, may have um, less information on whether or not it, it, it um, helps to improve um, enthesitis and psoriatic arthritis. So on a whole, if you have, if enthesitis is a main problem, um, that is an indication um, and you haven't responded to NSAIDs um, uh, to look at biologic medications. Okay, next question. I've been on Enbro for 15 years. It's not working anymore. What would be another biologic I could go on? This is another question that I think uh, both myself and Dr. Husney will probably um, have some answers to, and they may differ depending on psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So I'll take the first stab at this one. First of all, I'll say congratulations for staying on Enbro for 15 years. And I think that highlights two things. Number one, that when you have a biologic that is working, then you should stick with it. At least my motto is, if it's not broken, do not try to fix it. Despite newer biologics coming out that may look more effective on paper, the bottom line is the best biologic for you is whichever one is working. Number two, I think because you've responded so well to Enbro for so long, at least for psoriasis, I think certainly you would still be eligible and I would predict potentially a very good response to another TNF-alpha inhibitor. But beyond that, I think for psoriasis specifically, really any biologic, you know, since Enbro has come out, Enbro was one of the first biologics to come out. And since then there have been multiple, not only TNF alpha inhibitors that have come out, but of course biologics in other classes that have worked very well for our psoriasis patients. Used to kinumab, um, several interleukin 17A inhibitors like secukinumab and ixakizumab, and now the newest class are the interleukin 23 inhibitors like risenkizumab and guselkumab. So I think really it's fair to try any biologic that you have not yet been exposed to. And I would say what you wanna do is have a conversation with your prescribing physician, whether that's a dermatologist or a rheumatologist, and talk a little bit about the potential benefits and um, negatives about any of the biologics and make that decision together and try it. And again, in three months, if things are not working out as well as you and your physician would hope, luckily you have a lot of other options. I, I completely agree that, uh, you know, staying on, you know, a biologic that works best for you is, um, it's okay to stay as long as it works. Um, and I'm also not a big believer of, you know, just cycling through because it's new. 
Um, when a biologic doesn't work anymore, that is, uh, you know, quite disappointing because, you know, many patients get great relief at the beginning and we see this. Uh, this is really an active area of research, you know, um, for us to see why some people stay on medicine and some people, um, you know, despite getting a good response, will eventually sort of lose that response, that durability of that response. Um, I agree that I usually just, uh, you know, maybe within class might switch once to the same class, but I'm not sure I would go down and, you know, you know, there's five TNFs on the market, for instance, I'm not sure I would, you know, um, go beyond, you know, two, you know, two or three, to, you know, uh, of them, I wouldn't cycle through all the class of TNF before I'd go to the next one. Um, so it's definitely a, you know, physician, patient, um, you know, just Decision. There's lots of things that go into it. Each of the medicines have a little bit nuance of different, you know, side effects. Um, so we do have to take a good patient history um, to see uh, where we would go next once uh, the biologic um, no longer is as effective. Um, I can tell you that sometimes in my patients, when you lose a little bit of efficacy, I might add methotrexate or I might add another oral um, DMARD um, to the picture before I actually go and switch. So that all depends on um, what it means by not working anymore, you know, not working at all or not working 10%. So, so there are some nuances that we can do. The next question is about skin plaques um, and clearing um, that um, even though sometimes the plaque clears, but the skin still looks inflamed, what can I use to make my skin look more clear? This is another great question. So I think what's being described here is the medicines that are being given may be working very well to clear the active psoriasis, but then the skin doesn't look normal. And that actually occurs in a subset of patients. Many patients clear and the skin looks completely normal, but a subset of patients will develop areas that really represent post-inflammatory pigment alteration. And that is a phenomenon that can occur in any skin that is inflamed by any disease process. It is not specific to psoriasis. And essentially, we do not have great treatments for that. It's The best treatment is really time. If that skin can stay cleared, then eventually the immune system surveillance cells in the skin will help to clear what's making that visual appearance. And um, you know, it's usually pigment that, that drops from the upper layer of the skin. And eventually things will look normal. But if it's very bothersome to you, and if it's also involving uh, very sensitive anatomic locations like the face or other areas that are seen by uh, most people that you encounter, then I would suggest that you go see a dermatologist who may or may not have you see a dermatologist who specializes in cosmetic procedures to see what can be done. And I think the options really depend on the anatomic locations where this is occurring, as well as the, the, the severity of that post-inflammatory change. Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Next category. Um, you're still on treatment here. Lot, lots of questions on treatment. So, um, so are there treatment and lifestyle adaptations that you would recommend um, for a teenage girl with scalp psoriasis? Great question. So we, we talked a little bit about the scalp psoriasis. So we'll we start with topical medicines, shampoos, solutions, um, and uh, in terms of lifestyle changes. Um, you know, I think, I think in general, what we try to promote is a healthy lifestyle. We, to, to eat healthy, to um, get adequate amounts of exercise based on your age, uh, to try to do your best to minimize life stressors that we all have, and to get adequate sleep. I mean, all of those are important and can make a difference. And of co course, social habits. So to avoid things like smoking, and drinking excess alcohol, which a teenage girl should not be drinking any alcohol, of course. Um, we try to discourage those habits and do the best we can. And if the, if the conservative treatments are not enough and it's still bothersome to the patient, then we escalate to uh, a little more aggressive systemic therapies to try to get everything under control. 
Okay, so next, next question. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Next question, my doctor did a biopsy of my plaques, which confirmed psoriasis. Is psoriatic arthritis automatically diagnosed if one experiences joint pain in that instance? Absolutely not. <laughs> so, um, so although um, everybody, you know, when you look at a, a whole group of people with psoriasis, confirmed psoriasis, I, only about a third um, uh, will develop psoriatic arthritis. Um, this is a tricky question because obviously, um, you know, we're talking about psoriatic arthritis. So, you know, Dr. Fernandez and I probably see more patients that may have um, the psoriatic arthritis by our referral circle. But in general, I would not say it's automatically diagnosed because there's so many things that can cause um, joint pain. So even though you have psoriasis um, and you have joint pain, you could have osteoarthritis. Um, you know, you could have a repetitive injury. Um, so, so there's many things, um, you know, you can have many soft tissue, you know, sort of tendonitis that's unrelated um, to psoriatic arthritis. So it is really important that even if you do um, have um, documented psoriasis and your joints are aching or they're stiff, that's still going to a rheumatologist to really get a good history and a good exam and to, you know, maybe do some imaging to help diagnose psoriatic arthritis is really important because there's a lot of mimics out there. And I hate for you know, people to think, well, I have psoriasis and this hurts, so I definitely have you know, psoriatic arthritis. And, you know, and sometimes they might even you know, tell their dermatologist that even without as having a rheumatology exam, um, just because they truly believe that. And you, know, you, you could be right, but I think it'd be much better if you would take the time to see a rheumatologist um, because I think there's some nuances in treatment. So I wouldn't say it's just, you know, sort of, um, you know, a one-step process. Like, okay, after psoriasis, I have joint pain, then my next treatment would be, you know, X. Um, I do think there's some um, value because of the mimics um, that there are out there. Uh, so what alleviates pustular psoriasis symptoms the best? I'm not sure that there's one treatment that is best for pustular psoriasis. And also there are different types of pustular psoriasis. Patients can have generalized pustular psoriasis. Um, the, sometimes the pustular psoriasis just represents a one-time significant disease flare that's associated with pustules. Patients can have pustular psoriasis involving the palms and the soles and not on the rest of the body. So there are different types of pustular psoriasis but really none of them are characterized by responding to one specific medication. We use all the, the same medications for pustular psoriasis that we use for plaque psoriasis. And again, we really go through the, the time and thought to try to give patients the medical regimen that works best, but is safest for them. So if somebody has pustular psoriasis just involving the palms and the soles, then we will typically start with topical medications. Now the palms and the soles, the skins are so thick, or the skin so much thicker than other areas of the body that we'll use oftentimes the strongest topical medicines that we have available to us. But if those are not effective, then we escalate to systemic therapies. And um, similarly with generalized pustular psoriasis, usually that's something that right off the bat requires systemic medications. And um, really, we use the same algorithms that we use to treat plaque psoriasis. What are the ways to cope with the mental effects of psoriatic arthritis, such as depression and hopelessness? Great question. Uh, so we know that there are a lot of um, psychosocial effects from having chronic diseases such as psoriatic arthritis. And it is really important um, to understand that um, depression and um, feelings of being overwhelmed and hopelessness can exist. I think it's important to really understand whether the depression um, is, uh, you know, major depression, I would say, you know, to really help categorize with a patient. So some of my patients will just kind of feel down because they have a chronic disease and now they're learning about all these medicines and it's affecting the way they interact with their family, affecting their sleep, affecting the way they are at work. 
And then there's some people that have major depression that needs to be diagnosed and worked with a psychologist or a psychiatrist um, where they can actually, uh, you know, prescribe medicine um, and, and, you know, have a sort of a higher level of really, um, you know, where their depression can um, really lead to, to poor outcomes. And then there are people that just have more, I think, low mood, low energy, um, lots of fatigue, um, where we can cope with uh, many of the lifestyle um, strategies and changes and wellness strategies that we have now. So meaning incorporate, um, you know, better sleep habits. So we had mentioned that, you know, people really can't really get away with, you know, three, four or five hours of sleep, right? We really want to, you know, uh, get eight hours of sleep, really want to uh, manage stress. If stress is a big component of your life, you know, um, either whether that's simply learning how to meditate, simply having, you know, decreasing your social isolation, all those are very helpful for people with just sort of a low mood. So I would really, um, you know, really answer that question depending on sort of which um, way uh, many people fall in, in um, depression. And there's nothing to be ashamed about. We know that patients with chronic disease have an increased risk of depression. And if yours needs medication and, you know, needs other physicians as a team member, to help with this, then we need to get you help. If you feel like this is just a more mild, you know, sort of daily, um, you know, low mood, then I think, you know, lifestyle changes can be very important. But, uh, but I know Dr. Fernandez may also, you know, deal with this with the psoriasis world as well and may have some um, added insights. You know, um, Dr. Husning, I think I, I agree with everything you've said. I'm, I'm not sure that I do anything differently. Great. You have a great protocol. So next question, can you explain what biologics actually do? And, um, you know, do they treat both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis? Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give a short answer in the interest of time and then let Dr. Husney add on to anything um, that I've uh, forgotten to mention. Essentially, biologics are antibodies that are synthesized in a laboratory. And antibodies tend to recognize and bind to very specific molecules. And for psoriasis, these antibodies have been uh, developed and are synthesized to recognize components of the inflammatory environment that we know are very important for psoriasis and or psoriatic arthritis. And um, because antibodies cannot be ingested and survive the acids of your gastrointestinal tract, that's why we often have to give them as either an injection or via an infusion, uh, because they're very sensitive to, to the GI tract acids. And a lot of them do seem to be effective, maybe to variable degrees for both psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. Um, in fact, boy, I think there are very few right now that are approved for only psoriasis or only psoriatic arthritis. So Dr. Husney, please add, add anything to, to that answer. Yeah, I completely agree. That was a really nice overview. I think the, you know, the term biologics can sometimes be a little confusing. Um, so it's, I think you hit on all the highlights just for me to kind of re, uh, summarize again, but really biologics, um, are a lot more targeted um, because they're sort of man-made and they're specific to a certain protein. Um, so it's IL-17 or an IL-23. Um, so in that way, um, unfortunately, they're also more expensive because it costs more to make them. And so, you know, we see um, that as being um, one of the limitations. Um, and then you also mentioned the delivery. So these are usually um, injectables or infusions as opposed to oral um, medications. So next we're going to look turn to related health conditions. Whoop. Try that again. Okay. There we what go. Type of, what type of doctor do I go to first to be diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis? And why see a doctor if I possibly have psoriatic arthritis? Right. So, you know, I think that um, many of our patients um, usually see somebody like Dr. Fernandez first because the psoriasis usually precedes the psoriatic arthritis. Not always, 
but I would say in the majority of time they do. So chances are if they have mild psoriasis, they might just be under the care of a primary care doctor. If they have more moderate severe psoriasis, they're usually under the care of a dermatologist. But once they start developing, uh, once you start having symptoms of joint pain, joint swelling, um, redness, uh, you know, inability to sort of um, do the things that you normally can do, um, then I think seeing a rheumatologist becomes really important because we do a different exam and we order and are more comfortable, I would say, ordering imaging and labs that are related to the systemic illness. So I do think that a rheumatologist can play uh, an important role when we're, um, you know, at the initial diagnosis. Um, and then also, um, once you get diagnosed, um, to then work with a dermatologist to find treatment um, that can really optimize your health and lower the side effects that you might get from any of these treatments. Yeah, and I, I just want to, uh, on top of that, Dr. Husney, um, say that I, I completely agree. And I think, as you pointed out earlier, you know, there, there may be nuances to the treatments that are chosen if a patient truly is thought to have psoriatic arthritis or has what turns out to be a mimicker of psoriatic arthritis, some different type of arthritis or different type of joint pain. So patients really should go to see an expert rheumatologist who is familiar with all different conditions that can be associated with joint pain. Great, so the next question is, besides arthritis, what does psoriasis do internally? And do skin clearing drugs such as um, Otesla also treat internal damage? This is another great question. And again, I'll start and let and Dr. Husney can add on to, to what I say. Um, this could be a whole hour lecture in and of itself. So in the interest of time, yes, psoriasis, especially in its moderate to severe form. So if you have more than three percent of your body surface area involved with psoriasis, and you can think of 1% as the surface area of your hand. If you have more than three palms worth of psoriasis on your body, then really you meet criteria to have moderate degree psoriasis. And we think that patients who have moderate to severe psoriasis do have systemic inflammation. And arguably the most important organ system that we think has that inflammation is the cardiovascular system. And it's well known, there is a vast amount of research that has shown that patients with moderate to severe psoriasis have increased risks of a number of different cardiovascular comorbid events over time. And part of our goal when we see patients with moderate to severe psoriasis and why we often will suggest systemic medications, especially biologics, is that we're not just trying to control the skin rash, but we wanna control that systemic inflammation. Now, how well that does over time is still an area of an intense research, and I don't think we have definitive answers yet, but certainly that is part of our goal. Um, so we do think systemic medications, including medications like Otesla or Premalast, if they're clearing the skin, then we think that they're probably doing something positive to that systemic inflammation, including vascular inflammation. Dr. Husney, please add. Yeah, I mean, I think you summarize that so well. Uh, you know, we are always worried about related conditions or comorbidities when you have a systemic um, um, disease. So even though you, we see the inflammation in the skin um, as psoriasis, and, you know, we can show you inflammation in the joint, unfortunately, these sort of systemic inflammatory responses can spill over into these other organs that Dr. Fernandez mentioned. So you can get heart disease, you can get bone affected, which you can get osteoporosis from having, you know, a highly inflamed systemic um, condition. So our, to the best of our knowledge, uh, when we control that systemic inflammation, our thought process is that then we can also control um, or decrease your risk for osteoporosis, decrease your risk for cardiovascular disease. But as Dr. Fernandez said, uh, you know, this is an area of intense research and, you know, it's really hard to randomize somebody, um, you know, into treatment and no treatment, which is why it's really hard for us to say, okay, you know, does this medicine, you know, actually also, you know, decrease um, comorbidities? 
it's really not ethical, you know, to really be doing those trials where we can really answer that question definitively, meaning, you know, some of our patients go on drug and some of our patients don't go on drug and we watch them over 10 years. That's probably not a, a trial that we can do, which then limits our ability to really answer this question specifically. But we also do know um, that patients that are sort of uncontrolled or have a little bit more inflammation because we can't get their inflammation down do tend to have more of those comorbidities. So logic tells us that the better we control um, a patient's in inflammatory um, disease, the better their overall uh, comorbidities will also be. So going okay. on to research, um, we can see if we can answer a couple questions before we have to, to go. Um, any medications currently developing now, new ones? Um, and how about the patch version of Stellara? I'm unaware of a patch version of Stellara. Are you, Dr. Husney? Have you heard of this? So um, maybe not Stellara per se, but I know that there has been, you know, many, um, you know, sort of like an estrogen patch, you know, yes. um, some, some topical I, absorption of medications. I'm not sure that antibodies, biologics are mostly antibodies. I'm not sure that they can penetrate through the skin on a patch. But to answer the first part of that question, yes, there are uh, medications being developed now and some of them are actually getting very close to hopefully being approved by the FDA and becoming more options that we have available to use in clinic. Um, and those include not only biologic medications, the one that comes to mind is bimikizumab, which is a unique medication that blocks not only interleukin 17A, like secakinumab and ixakizumab, Tolts and Cosentix is how you may know their names, but also blocks interleukin 17F. And the oral medication, decrevacitinib, which is um, related to the Janus kinase inhibitors, which if you only have psoriasis, you may not know about, but um, Dr. Husney and I, who treat various chronic inflammatory diseases, are very familiar with that class of medicines. And those have, have some pretty interesting data. Dr. Husney, anything else to add? Yeah, I'm just going to combine those first two questions, actually, as I'm reading it now, because there's, you know, are there any promising breakthroughs in the horizon? And I think, you know, Dr. Fernandez, you just mentioned uh, two of the ones that uh, we're really looking forward to doing. I do want to mention that um, I would say that you, Dr. Fernandez, is a lot luckier because many of these medications <laughs> can clear psoriasis. And I feel that there's, you know, we are still not there yet. So I don't have anything that, a hundred, you know, I can reach what we call ACR 100 which is the way that we look at joint counts. Um, so in the rheumatology world, um, I feel like, um, you know, uh, so grateful that there are new drugs because the existing drugs, I cannot get as much disease clearance um, as you can in, in uh, psoriasis. So last treat but not, um, treatments um, that are being researched for, um, for people with psoriatic arthritis and a history of melanoma. I think I'm gonna t give you that one just because melanoma is definitely something I look to you <laughs> um, when I'm trying to uh, assess this. Well, melanoma, of course, is a very serious diagnosis, as are many other cancers. And there has been research looking at uh, melanoma in patients who take various systemic medications that are commonly used to treat psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. And luckily, the, the overwhelming results that have been found are that these medications do not seem to increase risk of melanoma spreading to other organs or patients developing de novo melanoma who have not ever had that diagnosis. So really it's it's most of the options that we have available to us we can use. However, um, in general, especially if patients have melanoma that, that it has already been found to spread to a lymph node or other organ system, Certainly, we prefer to work in teams, and we will confer with the patient's oncologist and uh, melanoma or whatever cancer team they have, and make sure that everyone's on the same page and comfortable with whatever we end up uh, prescribing. Great. Yeah, we definitely look at melanoma as the more serious, and we 
do rely on our uh, dermatologists to get interpretation of, you know, how severe their, you know, melanoma is in treatment options. Well, thank you, Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Husney for such a great Q&A session. You shared a, a lot of great information uh, in regards to the questions that were presented. And thank you for your time and expertise today. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to answer all the questions about symptoms, treatment, related conditions, and what's upcoming. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Beth. Thanks for the invitation and thank everyone in the audience for attending this evening. Or yeah, this afternoon, you. depending on where you live. <laughs> I really <laughs> like this format, uh, Dr. Fernandez, kind of just, you know, uh, getting a lot of, you know, info in with, with the Q&A. It's kind of a, you know, a nice way to kind of give an overview of psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. So thanks yes. for those questions in. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, so May is Psoriatic Arthritis Action Month. Uh, during May, the MPF is encouraging you to learn more about the disease from screening to treatment options. Uh, there are six small things you can do, which includes if you don't have the disease, take a quick, short questionnaire to assess your risk for psoriatic arthritis. Uh, you can take small steps to move more. You can request our free e-kit with information about psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, and assistive devices that help you to be more mobile. You can learn more about treatments to help decrease risks associated with related conditions, such as Dr. Fernandez and Dr. Husney mentioned. Uh, you can set small goals by being more active, so join a team NPF event, uh, either virtually or in person. And also May is Mental Health Awareness Month. It's been a tough year, so be sure to check in, take a quick screening questionnaire for depression, which you can learn more at the uh, URL that's listed at the top of the screen. Psoriasis.org slash PSA hyphen action hyphen month. And take time to listen to some of our podcasts. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Ghana, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or a feed service of your choice. Uh, you can access podcasts at the website listed here. Uh, you can listen to similar topics such as Diagnosis of Psoriatic Arthritis with Dr. Husney, or you can catch your webinar on May 27th. There's Domains of Psoriatic Arthritis by Dr. Evan Siegel and just released on Tuesday, Choose Joint Friendly Exercises for Psoriatic Arthritis with Physical Therapist and Orthopedic Clinical Specialist Pam Bowling. Look for other episodes about psoriatic arthritis releasing soon. A reminder, join our first virtual town hall addressing questions received about COVID-19 uh, from our experts, dermatologists, and co-chair of the NPF COVID-19 Task Force, Dr. Joel Gelfan, professor of dermatology at University of Pennsylvania Perlman School of Medicine, and NPF chief scientific and medical officer, Dr. Stacy Bell. Dr. Gelfan and Dr. Bell will address your questions about the vaccines and psoriatic disease, vaccine effectiveness, post-vaccine flares, vaccine use in kids, and more. Register at psoriasis.org slash NPF hyphen town hyphen hall envisioning hyphen the hyphen future. You can also contact the Patient Navigation Center, the world's first personalized support center for people impacted by psoriatic disease. If you still have questions, would like additional information about treatment options, need help finding a physician, or having issues with accessing treatments, contact the Patient Navigation Center by phone, email, or live chat as indicated on the screen. You can also connect with others through our one-to-one -one program. Uh, and you can reach out at education at psoriasis.org or call 800-723-9166, option one. Once you leave today's webinar, you'll receive a survey to provide feedback about the presentation. Tell us what you think. We value and appreciate your comments. Thank you again to our sponsors for Psoriatic Arthritis Action Month, Abby, Amgen, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson and Novartis for their support of today's webinar. 
Finally, you can access our webcast archive at psoriasis.org forward slash walked hyphen and hyphen listen. A reminder, you can catch Dr. Husney again for an upcoming webinar addressing challenges and considerations of diagnosing psoriatic arthritis on May 27th. Register at the same address listed above. This concludes our presentation for today. Thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Have a good Thank afternoon you. and evening. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez, and thanks, Dr. Husney, for being here tonight. Thank you, Bev. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.